This is the last episode of a three-part series on the wild history of a place called Booger Hole. If you haven't seen the first two parts, the links are in the description. If you've already watched them, let's go on an adventure. Before we get started, I just wanted to note that since I've started this series, I've learned that while I've been saying booger hole, there are some people who say booger hole. I've heard it both ways. I suppose that's the hard part of figuring out how to say a place name that only lives in people's memories. You say neither, I say neither. You say booger. Ew. And I say booger. Let's call the whole thing off. Just kidding. Let's do this. <laughs> I'm Luke Bozerman, and this is American Mythology, folklore, history, and the stories we tell. This episode is about searching for the past. As I was researching the story of Booger Hole, I had to know, is there tangible history from this place and time still out there? I wanted to visit. But it's not on the map. But other than knowing it was in Clay County, West Virginia, I had no idea where to find it. The name had been erased from the map. And according to historian James Gay Jones, after the departure of the lawless inhabitants, all the houses of the area were burned to the ground. I ran across a newspaper article from 1971 that showed a local resident sitting on the cornerstone of Preston Tanner's house. The paper notes that except for an occasional abandoned house, Booger Hole is nearly deserted. I found other details that hinted at tangible history. Nona Stevenson once said in an interview that she had a relic left by the mob that tried to hang Andrew and Howard Sampson. We have the rope with the noose already tied as a souvenir, a grim reminder that crime does not pay and of the lynching that might have been but nothing told me where to look to see this history for myself. I decided to begin with things that might be easier to find. Searching for the grave of Howard Sampson seemed like a good start. So I'm here in Calhoun County, West Virginia at the Cottrell Cemetery. And uh, I am here to check out the grave of uh, Howard Sampson. The cemetery was at the top of a steep hill, only accessible on foot. There were a lot of tombstones in this graveyard that didn't have their names visible anymore. A lot of them were hand carved out of softer rock, you know, stuff that erodes really quickly in the weather. Um, I was able to locate um, the part of the graveyard where a lot of Samson's were buried. I did find one gravestone that, that matched up kind of shape wise with some photos I've seen of Howard's. So I will show you that the writing on the stone is, is no longer visible, but I do believe it is his. I wasn't fully satisfied by the results of my search for the grave. Would you look at that empty handed? Would you look at that? So I decided to look for the Coal and Coke Railroad, the path taken by the Booger Hole refugees when they made an exodus from Clay County. Chicka, 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 toot, toot. After consulting a few old maps, I made a trip to see what I could find. I arrived just in time to see the stacks of railroad ties removed to make way for the Elk River Rail Trail, a bike path. Oh, you almost had it. You gotta be quicker than that. The next logical thing was to visit Booger Hole itself. But again, I didn't know where it was. I had reached a dead end. Then, through a stroke of luck, I made contact with Pamela Tanner, a descendant of Preston and Ossie's family. Pamela was very generous in sharing family photos with me and she helped get me into the inner sanctum of Clay County Booger Hole history. The inner sanctum of the entire operation? Well, it's pretty mundane these days. It's a nice rolling hill country, uh, sparsely populated. 
That was Lucinda Curry, author and local historian of Booger Hole. She knows exactly where Booger Hole is. It turns out that it's just a quiet country neighborhood these days. It's a nice area to live in. Good people living here. Lucinda took me on a tour. I'm down at the forks of the road uh -huh. and brought him and another guy, Mr. Carpenter, up in there and tied him to a tree and, and, and shot him. These are hand hewn stones, like I said, by a, a stonemason, um, like Andrew Hargis, who disappeared up here. It would have been impossible to piece this story together without her help. At the end of the tour, we sat down on the porch of her family home to talk. What do you remember hearing about all this history, you know, growing up in this area? Well, Luke, uh, as I was uh, growing up, I was um, raised in Charleston, but my grandparents owned property up here, and it had been their grandparents' property and their grandparents' property before them. And um, so my brother and I spent all of our summers up here with our grandparents. And um, I would hear stories that they would tell and, and their neighbors about Booger Hall and about uh, the ghost stories and Civil War stories and, you know, just all of that growing up. And uh, so when I got older and uh, and we moved up here, my husband and I, um, we, I just thought, well, I better, you know, it'd be nice to write these stories down. My grandparents were getting older and all their neighbors were that, that had told these stories over the years. And um, the courthouse had burnt down. Um, and the interstate had come through in the 70s, and, and a lot of people had moved out of the area um, due to that as well. So there were a lot of the records, I was afraid, would just, you know, go away and, 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 and get lost. So um, I just started interviewing people. What kind of reactions did you have from the people that you wanted to interview? Were people excited to tell their stories? Were they reluctant to, or both? Or? That's an interesting question, uh, because a lot of times they were actually reluctant to tell their stories. And even though they would tell their story, uh, you know, sort of entice it out of them, then they would tell me, well, you can put my story in there, but don't put my name. There's a lot of family histories, uh, you know, different grudges between families, things like that, just like there is all over. But uh, I think that that sort of fed into that, that they didn't want to, you know, talk about something that might come back, you know, on them. <laughs> was there any, anything that you dug up when you were putting all this together that was surprising to you? Well, I heard a lot of stories growing up, so it wasn't real surprising. Uh -huh. But I think the, the multitude of stories, uh, you know, I'd heard two or three, and then as I started digging more, you know, and talking to more people, then they would have additional stories. It wasn't always a repeat of the same ones. I mean, some of the bigger stories, like the the uh, murders of Lacey Ann Boggs and, and the Preston Tanner murder and Andrew Hargis, the, the stonemason disappearing up in here, some of those were all, you know, stories that people told. But then there was others that they added to it. And in fact, since this book came out, um, I've had other people reach out to me with more stories that I've sort of been collecting. I might do a part two. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was able to find quite a few records from, um, you know, about these stories. Not just the, the older people that I interviewed, but the uh, high school had had a really great um, program that they called Hickory and Lady Slippers. And they would have the kids in high school interview their parents and grandparents. And booger hole stories kept coming up in those hickory and lady slippers as well. So um, just gathering all that information from different sources uh, and from different writers that also had put them in ghost story books about West Virginia uh, and then doing my own interviews, um, it resulted in this little book of, of stories. I've read Lucinda's book several times now. And even though there's no museum full of artifacts from the booger hole story, Lucinda has done a wonderful job of preserving the local history. Her book is full of tales of ghosts and hauntings in the area. In Booger Hole, it seems that folklore remembers what history forgot. Uh, we do uh, occasionally have heard sounds in the night, uh, have um, experienced you know, some of these eerie type feelings when you're out there in the woods. And it might just be overactive imagination, um, but it could be that these ghosts are still trying to tell their story. You know what? It seems appropriate to end this series with a Booger Hole ghost story. Come on. This story comes from Lucinda Curry's book and was told to her by Wilson Douglas. You might remember him from the first episode. One time I was hunting in Battle Run. Nobody ought to be over there much. I think I got three squirrels. I knew there were some walnut and hickory trees at the top of the hill, 
and I made my way up to a big hickory, and then I chose a spot to sit with my back against another tree so I could watch the hickory. The squirrels were coming to that big tree. There must have been four or five of them in it gathering hickory nuts. The leaves were so thick it was hard to see them, but I had plenty of time, and besides, it was a nice morning. It had rained a little, and the sun had come out. I was sitting there relaxing and watching the tree when I noticed a dim path. I guessed where the animals had traveled to and from there, but something made me doubt it. It was then I heard a brush crack, like somebody stepped on a grouse tick. Just naturally, I looked up and saw this woman a coming. She was just floating along. She had the whitest, warmest looking gown that reached down over her feet, and I wondered who that could be. There was some whiskey making over there in them days, and I thought maybe them moonshiners had some woman over there, and they had gotten into some kind of fight. She kept coming closer like she didn't see me, and probably didn't because she had her hands over her face. And Lord, she was a dying. I never heard nothing so pitiful in my life. I kept looking at her, and I thought, when she gets opposite of me, I'll make a noise or something and see what happens. Well, she kept a-walking, and I thought, I'll make a noise after she comes another few feet. But she just floated up into the air and disappeared. Well, I sat there another few minutes, and I wasn't scared. Then I thought about other tales hunters had told me, and it dawned on me that they had probably seen this very woman. Everything got so still after that. It got so still that the quiet hurt my ears. By then it was getting late, so I walked off the mountain and came on home. Later I told my dad about it and he said, yeah, you're liable to see anything over in that holler. This is the final episode of Booger Hole that I'll be posting on YouTube. If you want more, I'll be posting the story of a shootout near Booger Hole on my Patreon page. It actually involves some members of the Samson family. As a matter of fact, I'm posting it today. So if you're watching this, the Patreon video is already waiting for you. And if you enjoyed this, don't forget to like and subscribe.